to another exciting episode of Gathering More Leaves, the podcast where we answer the question, who put the bump in the bump, a bump, a bump? Hello and welcome to an intriguing episode of Gathering More Leaves, a podcast series that explores the fascinating topics of history and genealogy. I'm your host, David M. DeBacker. Only four children are documented. There's two sons, John and Jonathan, and two daughters who are both named Elizabeth and who were baptized shortly before their deaths. So uh, they, that's believed that these Elizabeths were born at different times and they uh, died, short, uh, died in infancy. Now, as the fact that John and Elizabeth were married for over 20 years, it's likely that there were other children who did not survive. In the uh, second book, this uh, genealogy book, uh, it states that uh, we don't know whether John Pickering was a, a church member or not. But we do know that he's not recorded as having taken the Freeman's oath. And I guess apparently this was an oath that in the Puritan, uh, ba uh, the Massachusetts Bay Colony, uh, in order to become a citizen of the colony and enjoy the rights of citizenship, uh, voting, I guess, is the main thing, that you had to take this uh, Freeman's oath. I, I've seen it before, but I, I can't remember what it stated, but uh, it's something about, you know, liberty and all that, all that sort of stuff. So we also know from this that um, he would have not held public office because he would have had to have taken the Freeman's oath. And so we can also infer that he was also not a member of the congregation. Puritans did not keep anyone out who is not Puritan, but those who were not members of the church were not allowed the benefit of full citizenship. And again, I'm not clear on what that was. I, a right to bear arms was one of them, definitely. And then also, yeah, because they didn't, anybody who was not a citizen, they didn't want them uh, carrying uh, weapons. And so if they were going to kick you out, that would be the first thing they would have done. They would disarm you before they figured out where you were, they were going to send you. There is some suggests, uh, some researchers suggest that Elizabeth's maiden name is known, and that is because a John Alderman of Salem bequeathed her an item in his will in 1657. And uh, this uh, John Alderman, who lived originally in Dorchester in 1634, and then later moved to Salem, he made bequests in his will to Elizabeth's sons, John and Jonathan, and to Elizabeth. And this led to speculation that John Alderman may have been Elizabeth's father's, uh, been Elizabeth's father, uh, potentially making her maiden name Elizabeth Alderman. Other than that, we don't know anything else of, about her. That she did remarry, we do know that. John Pickering, the eldest son of John and Elizabeth Pickering, my ancestor, he was my ancestor, was born and died in Salem. He was a farmer who resided there. In 1684, he is, his, he is listed as Lieutenant John Pickering, and he and his wife were admitted to a membership in the First Church of Salem. And he gained full communion in the church on April 1st, 1694. Through inheritance and a purchase from other heirs, he acquired the family mansion where he continued to live and eventually passed it down to his son, also named John. And so this began a, the chain of uh, generations of Pickerings who lived uh, in this house in Salem on uh, Broad Street. According to uh, another book uh, titled uh, The An Annals of uh, Salem by Joseph B. Felt, the second John Pickering was well known for his involvement in public affairs his, and his continuous service demonstrated by his competence, his enterprise, and public spirit. So I guess unlike his father, John Pickering was in full communion with the uh, church and, uh, and, and held public office. So now 
That brings up the question as to what might have been his involvement during the Salem witch trials, which were from 1692 to 1693. And he, he passed away in the year following uh, the trial's conclusion in 1694. So he was an elder statesman in this community, and he served as a selectman for Salem Town multiple times. He held the position of constable in 1664 and was among those appointed to run the line between Salem and Lynn in 1669. At first, I thought this line between Salem and Lynn referred to a stagecoach line. But later I saw where the term perambulator was used in, re in reference to this position. And I know that today the word perambulator is used in uh, the UK to refer to as a baby carriage. But I, I thought, okay, well that, you know, that can't mean uh, a baby carriage in the 16th century. And so it turns out that in the 16th century, uh, or I should say the 17th century, it was used to describe a large wheel that contained a calibration mechanism that when pushed along the ground would measure distances like an odometer. And it was, a, it was used by surveyors to measure distances. So they were still plotting out land and chopping up land and, and doing that sort of thing along this area between Salem and Lynn or Linfield. And so what they were describing there that this uh, John Pickering, John Pickering was responsible at some point, was responsible to run the line between Salem and Lynn. And this was in 1669. It goes on to say that he was also responsible for collecting subscription money in Salem for the support of Harvard College. However, his prominence was most notable in military affairs. In 1675, he was appointed ensign of the Salem Militia. It appears that he turned down this offer and later received a higher rank as lieutenant. He served in this capacity during King Philip's War. It was an Indian war that lasted from 1675 to 1676. And uh, Lieutenant Pickering was present at the fight at Bloody Brook near Deerfield after the defeat of Captain Lathrop on September 18th, 1675. Lieutenant Pickering, along with another officer, led the troops and distinguished themselves for their skill and determination. In 1664, now we're jumping back a decade, Lieutenant Pickering was involved in a legal dispute with the owners of, uh, I guess, a company called the New Mill on South River. And he owned land adjacent to the river. And uh, he accused this the people of this company of being involved in damming the river and then hindering access to Pickering's land. But there was a condition to this that, why, what, what am I trying to say here? Hang on. The lawsuit concluded with a judgment in favor of the defendants. And the reason why this was is that the, the land, Pickering's land was not actually on the river. There was a stretch of land separating his land from the shores of the river. And apparently this land was uh, actually public land. Uh, it was, a, I guess, an easement of some sort that was belonged to the, uh, to the city or the town. And so I, I guess this technicality, this was considered a technicality by Pickering because he didn't, he didn't exactly recognize this, the fact that, th that this wasn't his land. Uh, however, the law was that this wasn't his land, and so the judgment was not in his favor. As I mentioned earlier, or going back in even another, even further in time to the 1657, uh, Lieutenant Pickering had been uh, a legatee under the will of John, 
alderman of, of Salem, uh, just as as was his mother and his brother Jonathan. And uh, the bequest to him consisted of specific items were listed. These were all household items. Uh, there was a table, two stools, a cloak, cloth breeches, worsted stockings, and two pounds of barley. How, how generous of Mr. John Alderman. The, though the exact day and month of his birth are not known, the family Bible of his son, John, records his birth year as 1637, which matches the age inscribed on his gravestone. He was buried. Now, okay, I noted that, that I say that this matches the age inscribed on his gravestone, but then the next thing I'm gonna tell you is that there was no gravestone. And so he, he died when he was 57 years old and uh, his, the day of his death or a day of his burial is given as May 5th, uh, 1694, but his gravestone along with others that were located on what is now called the Broad Street Burying Ground was then uh, Pickering Hill. And apparently all of these Pickerings were buried up on Pickering Hill, but the hill was excavated because apparently they needed the, the uh, rocks and whatever that were there for something, for filling potholes or something, I guess, I don't know. But the hill was torn down, so was the graveyard. The, all of the graves that were there were moved, but apparently the gravestones were damaged. They were so, they were not, you know, made of, you know, a permanent stone like granite or something like that. Uh, they may have, you know, been a, a cheap stone that um, deteriorated easily. And so that I, that is noted, that's what's noted in the book. So I, I'm not sure why I would also note that that, the, that that age matches what's inscribed on his gravestone because it doesn't exist. Lieutenant Pickering appears to have prospered and expanded his land holdings, leaving a substantial estate to his family. His will, which like I said, was dated in 1694, named him, named him as John Senior of Salem. And he bequeathed uh, land to his sons, Benjamin and William. I mentioned Benjamin, uh, Benjamin is my ancestor. He, John had several children, several sons, but to Benjamin, uh, he granted a piece of marsh at Forest River. Swampland? I, I don't know. His will also reveals that he owned uh, at least one slave, a girl named Maria, whom he left uh, to his wife, Alice, in the will. So uh, to those who think that there, that slavery didn't exist between north of the Mason-Dixon line, uh, and those certainly did, uh, certainly existed in, in Delaware, but it also existed in uh, colonial times in areas uh, before uh, colonies became states and states started enact, enacting laws against slavery. The, and, I, and also f uh, federal laws that early, early on were saying that there wasn't going to be slavery north of a certain line, north of Mason-Dixon line, north of uh, the Ohio River. Uh, moving on, the uh, family was living in Salem at the time of the uh, Salem witch trials, as I mentioned earlier, 1692 to 1693. But I, I've not found any record of the name Pickering involved in those proceedings. So I don't know which side they stood on uh, in the question of uh, witchcraft versus Christian extremism. Now, regarding Alice Pickering, who's previously known as Alice Flint. The records uh, state that she was admitted to the church in 1684. And uh, it was also, I guess, later discovered that by in the records that uh, prior to marrying John Pickering, she was also, she was married to a man by the name of Henry Bullock Jr. of Salem. And uh, by whom, uh, he, she had two children before becoming a widow and then marrying John Pickering. Now, the Alice Flint also appears mentioned in the court records for having violated a law against excessive dress. And this was in 1652. And despite being presented in court for having worn a silk hood, 
and violated this law against excessive dress. She was excused due to her declared worth of 200 pounds. So apparently uh, someone who was, I guess, having that much money, 12, 200 pounds was a, uh, a wealthy person in that community in those days. So apparently Puritans would excuse a person if they were wealthy, if they were to wear expensive clothes or ostentatious dress. Now, there is some confusion about whether this is actually referring to Alice Flint, the wife of John Pickering, because uh, she would have been only about 16 years old in 1652. She was the daughter of William Flint, and she was also the daughter of Alice Flint. Her mother's name is Alice Flint. So it's most likely that this is referring to uh, the mother wearing a silk hood and she's the one with the married to the husband with the, the substantial assets. And, and, and William Flint was a was a wealthy man in that town, and, and he held various town offices, including overseer of fences, surveyor of Southfield fences, and here's where the name the the preambulator comes up. He was noted as being preambulator of the Lynn Line. So that meant he was a surveyor or responsible for surveying and, and that there were actually people hired or enslaved to perform the act of actually measuring the lines. Who knows? He died on April the 2nd, 1673, and his estate was equitably divided. No, no, I'm sorry. There was a delay over the equitable dividing. His daughters, I guess, uh, disputed uh, the will uh, because they sh saying that they should have been granted, that all the heirs, all of his children, should have received an equitable division of his uh, estate. Now, so this is the two daughters. He dies in 1673. It wasn't settled until 1695, and they're early uh, actually, the early part of what you know, we count as 1696, January 1696, and this was a, it was a delay while these daughters disputed this, and they won, and they uh, actually uh, received an equitable division of the property. What was that 20 something, uh, 30, 20 years after their father died? Well, I see by the old clock on the wall that we've run out of time for today. And uh, that's all the time we have. So if you enjoyed watching this episode, don't forget to hit the like button and be sure to subscribe. Thank you and goodbye.